Hello, I'm Martin Reeves. Uh, I lead the strategy research at the Boston Consulting Group, and it's my pleasure to share some comments with you today on the important uh, topic of uh, business ecosystems. Uh, my field is strategy and business ecosystems, I think is uh, the hottest and newest and one of the most important topics in strategy. Um, 10 years ago, none of the world's largest companies were uh, digital ecosystems. And uh, we have a lot of changes in markets right now, but last time I checked, um, at least half of the uh, top 10 companies in the world are now digital ecosystems. So really an enormously uh, important uh, topic. So what we're going to do today is um, we're going to talk about what is a business ecosystem. Uh, we're going to talk about when to use one. We're going to talk about uh, benefits and risks and jobs to be done. Uh, we're going to talk about success factors. And we're going to talk about the important topic of uh, how legacy companies, companies that were not created as digital ecosystems, uh, can be uh, successful. So let's let's jump into that. Now, the word ecosystem, uh, it's an important word, an important construct, but it's also a much uh, abused word. I've heard uh, the word business ecosystem used to describe uh, a series of relationships, a supply chain, uh, even a portfolio of products or, or a company culture. But uh, the, the, the strict definition that I prefer is that it's a dynamic group of largely independent economic players uh, that together uh, constitute a coherent uh, solution. Um, so the essential uh, point there is that it's a group of companies collaborating to produce a solution. And what is revolutionary about that is that essentially it changes the unit of analysis in business because we're now talking about groups of collaborating companies and not the strategies of just individual companies as we've done uh, historically. And the reason we can do that is because of the characteristics of uh, standardized digital interfaces, which enable the coordination of uh, lots of complexity at very low transaction costs. So that's a, a relatively uh, new thing uh, in business. Now, um, an ecosystem um, is not a panacea. Uh, it's a structural choice, and we still have other choices. Um, we can structure something as an open market where users uh, buy components uh, that they need uh, on, on the market. For instance, we can buy individual electronic components and assemble them into a product. Uh, we can still choose to be a hierarchical supply chain. That makes sense for relatively uh, stable, simple products. Um, or we can be a single vertically integrated uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, when would we choose an ecosystem? We choose an ecosystem with this a very high need for coordination, the coordination of a lot of different capabilities uh, or complexity. And if the offering uh, is uh, sufficiently modular, uh, that we can uh, actually do that. So we can do that for taxi services, uh, we can do that for uh, products on Amazon. How to do that for a nuclear reactor is very important that we have an integrated uh, foolproof system. Um, so I, I think we it's important to bear in mind that this is not a panacea, it's a, a structural choice. Um, now, not all systems uh, are born equal. There are different types of systems we need to think about. And uh, one main distinction I would make is between a transactional ecosystem, where essentially a matchmaker, an orchestrator, is uh, essentially matching supply with demand. So you can think about this as Amazon or eBay um, or Uber. That's one type of ecosystem. A very different type of ecosystem is when a group of collaborating players uh, coordinate a, a complex um, a solution, such as a, uh, a semiconductor chip, for example. Um, where we have suppliers and complementers, uh, complementers and or, an orchestrator um, creating uh, a, a, an integrated combined uh, offering. Uh, the differences between these two, um, the, the one on the left, the solution ecosystem, um, usually has a, a, a less active role of the customer, the ultimate customer. Um, it is usually much more concerned with novelty uh, and, uh, and, and innovation. Um, and the timescales um, are, are much longer. You've got the development and research timescales as opposed to the time scale of, of, of transactions. So those uh, different types of ecosystem operate very differently. Um, when an ecosystem is successful, it really does have some remarkable properties um, that were historically um, uh, hard to access. One of them is uh, it's a great way of accessing new capabilities. So it's a way of uh, smaller companies um, accessing capabilities they didn't uh, uh, previously uh, have. 
Uh, it's an ability to scale um, extremely fast because you're essentially leveraging the assets and the capabilities of other players so you can move uh, very fast to create uh, something big and, uh, and complicated. Um, and um, an ecosystem can also be extremely flexible and resilient since the, uh, the players, the complementers and the suppliers to the ecosystem uh, can change uh, uh, dynamically. Um, so these tend to be very um, resilient to, uh, to very fast changing uh, uh, environments. Now, one claimed property of an ecosystem um, is that it's, uh, it also has very powerful competitive moats. It uh, creates a, a winner takes all uh, effect. Um, I think this is actually somewhat true uh, because of network effects and flywheel effects, but actually a little, um, a little overstated as I'll show uh, in, in a second. Um, now, an ecosystem is by no means um, a, a free lunch and it's not without risk. So we may have the impression uh, looking at the successful ecosystems, the ones that are dominant today, um, that they're very profitable, um, they, they're, they're very high asset productivity, um, they're uh, competitively uh, impenetrable. Uh, but actually, if you correct for survivor bias and you look back at um, uh, all of the ecosystems that aspire to be big um, over time, you find that actually only 15% of would-be ecosystems become successful ecosystems. About 50% uh, never take off. They never achieve uh, critical mass. Um, about 25% um, uh, do achieve some scale, um, but they, they're not able to evolve with a changing marketplace or changing uh, competition from other would-be ecosystems. And uh, so they peter out uh, very quickly. And um, about 10% achieve some degree of sustainability, but then they're not able to uh, evolve as uh, regulatory pressures come in or as competition uh, uh, emerges. So um, by no means are um, ecosystems uh, without, uh, without challenges. Now, in terms of um, how to approach strategy, um, since the unit of analysis is, is different, uh, we're talking about a group of companies, not a single company. The strategic logic is a little unfamiliar um, to companies that haven't done this before. And, and so here is, um, I think, a, a, a series of eight useful questions to ask um, if you're thinking about an ecosystem strategy. Um, the first one is, um, should we engage in a business ecosystem? So this is the design choice I talked about earlier. Are we better off uh, in terms of the modularity uh, of the of the offering and the need for coordination with a, a vertically integrated supply chain, um, a static supply chain, or an open market? Um, that's that's the first uh, key question. Um, the second one is an important one, which is, do we have a problem that's big enough to be worth solving with an ecosystem? Because creating an ecosystem comes with some costs, the sustained investment necessary to uh, to scale a platform, um, some sacrifice of control and predictability. So it really has to be um, uh, uh, a problem worth solving. And um, usually it's, it pays to look at uh, frictions. Are the frictions of the existing business model in terms of uh, delay and rework and, and a mismatch of supply and demand big enough uh, to be worth a, a, a revolutionary ecosystem offering. And the third one uh, is an important one, which is the role that one should play in an ecosystem. Um, almost all companies um, that I've discussed ecosystems with uh, naturally assume that they are the orchestrator. They have the right to be the orchestrator of an ecosystem. But of course, if we look at the arithmetic of ecosystems, when less than one in a hundred companies is actually able to become the orchestrator, clearly a lot of those companies must be misguided. So sometimes a complementer, a uh, a contributor to an ecosystem uh, is, is the right role. So to be an orchestrator, you need certain qualifications. Uh, you need something which is essential to the other players in the system, for instance, a brand or a critical piece of technology. Uh, you need the scale and the patience to be able to invest in the platform and sustain the risk of developing the platform. Uh, and also you need to not compete with the other people that you, uh, you want in, uh, uh, in your ecosystem. Um, now, if you do not qualify as an orchestrator, the good news is that actually um, there are very successful complementers around. Uh, the apparently less glamorous role of a complementer can also be very, very profitable, as is shown in the case of uh, uh, Aiden, which is the uh, payment solution which sits behind Uber, uh, which was profitable sooner than Uber and has been uh, uh, arguably more commercially successful than Uber as a business. So you don't need to be an orchestrator uh, to be successful. Um, 
Now, um, if you are a complementer, you've got to think about your benefit, your competitiveness uh, as a, a, a complementer in the ecosystem, your uniqueness, your uh, indispensability. If you're aiming to be an orchestrator, you need to think about how to build the ecosystem, how to uh, attract the uh, important players, the essential players uh, you need uh, to uh, create your first uh, iteration of the ecosystem. You need to think about your competitors, not just in terms of uh, makers of a particular product or offering, but also other groups of companies, other ecosystems, and other potential ecosystems. One of the competitive disruptions in the ecosystem space is that uh, companies with a platform for one thing can easily extend their reach across industries uh, to incorporate a, a smaller conception of an ecosystem. So you've really got to think about potential ecosystem uh, orchestrators and competitors and ask yourself, what is your advantage against them? Um, one of the characteristics of ecosystems is that you need to think about um, not just value capture, uh, but actual value creation, the elimination of the frictions in the traditional business model, which create the value, which then you need to, to capture. And that's a tricky thing because you need to capture value in ways that doesn't alienate and compete with directly uh, the other players uh, in your ecosystem, which is why monetization is often indirect in ecosystems you you can monetize through uh, advertising or transaction fees it's generally not a good idea to uh, to compete with the people uh, in your own ecosystem and to capture value that way and of course the value capture needs to be fair it needs to be enough for you to be viable but not uh, so much that you're abusing your dominance and you uh, alienate the other players in the ecosystem and then um, critically, um, uh, ecosystems are extremely uh, dynamic. You need to be able to evolve your offering over time. If you're successful with an ecosystem, there will be blowback. There will be uh, the losers will come back um, uh, with a with a uh, uh, with a new offering. Other ecosystems will enter. Uh, regulators uh, will mobilize, and you have to be prepared for all of that and continue to uh, evolve uh, your offering. In particular, um, governance is a key choice when thinking about uh, ecosystems. And within governance, um, the, the level of openness is an absolutely critical decision. If you are not open enough, then you won't recruit uh, complementers and suppliers to your ecosystem uh, fast enough. You won't scale fast enough. If you're too open, uh, then maybe you'll attract the wrong sort of participants onto your platform. For example, if, uh, if your platform has any um, social aspect, um, then if you have um, uh, abusive players or uh, players on your ecosystem which are going to alienate uh, other uh, players from joining your ecosystem, then you could, uh, you could lose, lose control, uh, you could uh, lose your, your brand equity easily. And so thinking through that, uh, that equation is a, is a very important one. And, uh, and also, of course, it can change over time and has changed over time. Um, uh, with uh, with different ecosystems. Um, uh, the Apple ecosystem, for example, has alternated between being uh, relatively uh, open and, and, and relatively closed. So as with everything else in ecosystems, things need to uh, evolve um, over time. Lastly, um, I'd uh, point to the importance of a, a different way of thinking about um, ecosystems to be uh, successful. Um, it's it's different from thinking about regular company strategy. Um, it's uh, it's more about disruption than steady state business. Uh, it, it tends to be very uh, outwardly focused because you've got to think about the other participants in your ecosystem as opposed to the typical inward focus of an enterprise. It's as much about value creation as value uh, capture. Um, uh, there's usually a high degree of complexity. You've got more players, so you can't control everything. So you've got to think much more selectively about which uh, information sources and uh, which control variables you uh, you you uh, aim to uh, to control. So, lastly, um, the question of can a legacy company be successful with an ecosystem? And um, the answer is uh, is is absolutely yes in a number of ways. So, here on the slide, you can see a variety of different types of legacy players, players that were not created as ecosystems that have been successful in uh, expanding their markets, expanding reach uh, of, of, of with their current products, uh, of uh, protecting their core offering, of uh, tapping into adjacency revenue pools, of running venture portfolios. Uh, there are now any uh, number of uh, legacy companies that with the adjustments and the thinking that, that we've talked about today have been successful with ecosystems. And um, 
So there is really no reason providing uh, that we they, one does shift one's approach to strategy um, that a, a legacy company uh, can't be successful. Now, um, we haven't had very much time today to discuss this uh, very rich topic. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, then uh, everything we've discussed today is explained in more detail uh, in this recently published book on, on business uh, ecosystems uh, from, uh, from De Groyter. Uh, so perhaps um, uh, some viewers would, uh, uh, would like to uh, dip into that. So that my time is up, let me uh, now uh, hand over to Tessa West.